Hey guys and welcome back to my channel. Today is Halloween and I really hope that you have a fun and especially a safe night in whatever your plans are tonight. So as part of All Hallows Week I'm going to be looking into a case that quite literally cancelled Halloween for one town and this is the case of the abduction and murder of Shauna Howe. I'd just like to let you know that I mean no disrespect to anyone I'm going to talk about today. I've gathered the information off the internet and compiled it into one video for educational purposes. Shauna Melinda Howe was born on the 11th of July in 1981. She lived with her mother Lucy Brown Howe and her stepfather John and they lived in Oil City in Pennsylvania. She also had a brother and a sister and she was just a typical little girl. She loved and having fun and messing around and just doing what kids do. She was described as being quite shy but a sweet little girl and like most kids do she absolutely loved Halloween. You get to dress up whatever costume you want, you go out and go to parties, you trick or treat, you get candy. It's just a really really fun time of the year and lots of kids enjoy it and it was one of Shauna's favourites. So this Halloween her parents couldn't really get a, a kind of a pre-made costume like you would buy from the store, store so she decided that she was going to make her own. She went through all the things and she came up with uh, this purple and green leotard and she put on some gloves and things like that and she basically made it into a gymnast outfit. She was really creative and she was so proud of what she'd done and it was a really really good costume. It was on the 27th of October in 1992 and Shauna wore this costume to school. Everyone was going to school in a Halloween outfit so off she went, she wore it to school, she was going to also wear it later on that night because there was a Girl Scouts Halloween party and she was going to go to it, she was in the Girl Scouts. So her mother in the morning dropped her off at school. Shauna was to do a few activities after this, after school. She, I believe she was in the choir and things like that. And then she was going to go and meet at this church, which was not very far from her house, which was uh, where all of the Girl Scouts were going to meet to obviously have this Halloween party. Now, Shauna's mother was working that night. She worked in a different town, I believe, and she couldn't actually pick her up from this Halloween party. So even though Shauna could walk, it, like I said, it wasn't that far really from her house, but obviously nobody really wants the kid to walk home on their own. She was only 11. So she said that she'd arrange her a lift and it'd be waiting outside for her when the party was finished. Lucy called home around 8 p.m. that night. She was just checking in basically. John, who was there with the other two children, told her that Shauna hadn't come home yet. And Lucy just kind of got this dread awful feeling in the pit of her stomach because she'd actually forgotten to arrange a lift home for Shauna. So she knew that the party would have probably finished by now and that maybe Shauna had either seen that there was no ride there for her and either walked home by herself or gone with a friend. They just kind of waited a little bit just to see whether Shauna would come home and I believe around half an hour later John decided that he was going to go out and look for her. He went through the normal route that she would have gone down, the main route, obviously thinking that he'd just catch her as she were coming home. He made it all the way to the church and he didn't see her. He, the party had finished, the church was all closed up. You could tell that it had been done for a little while. So I, he got a bit worried like you would. He went and checked the other routes that possibly she could have taken, but were less likely. So down sort of neighborhoods that were around the corner and things like that, you can actually go through to get to his house, but it's not the usual route you take. He went through all them, he looked down all the alleys, everything, and Shauna was nowhere to be seen. He did go back home because what if she had then come home in the time that he'd been out? Maybe they just missed each other. He was praying that they just missed each other and she would be home when he got there. When he got back, she still wasn't there. I believe this church was around about half a mile from the home, so it wasn't that far away. At around 9.30, Lucy was finishing up at work and she decided that she was going to ring Shauna's biological father. He lived in the next town over, he with her sister and 
she figured that maybe Shauna had just gone there. Maybe because there was no lift for her, she went there to see her dad. But her father said that he hadn't seen her. Lucy absolutely panicked at this and she rushed straight home. She got home around 10pm, I believe, and she decided to call Joey L, which was Shauna's best friend. This would have been the person that she would have, if she'd have gone to the party, because at this point they didn't even know if she made it to the party. They didn't know where she was. What if she had been snatched? Maybe she'd been snatched before she even got to the party. So anyway, they rang Joey and she said that yes, Shauna went to the party, they were both together when the party finished and Shauna quickly realised that there was no lift for her. She decided to walk home, they both decided to walk home. So. They got to a section, a corner, where they would have to split up. Now, Joey actually said to Shauna, come back to my house, my, I'll tell my dad that you need a lift home, and obviously we'll sort it out. Shauna didn't really want this. Shauna kind of wanted Joey to walk her home. And then when Joey suggested that, Shauna disagreed. Now, I don't know why, probably because she didn't want to be a burden to her friend's family. I, I'm not sure on that one anyway. She decided that she was going to walk home alone, which she didn't really want to do, but she did anyway. And the two girls parted ways. Little did jo Joey know that this would be the last time she would see her best friend alive again. Rightly so, her family absolutely panicked. She'd been missing for at least an hour since she split up with her friend at around 8-ish, just after 8. She'd not come home yet. It was now past 10 and she should have definitely been home. Like I said, it was only at half a mile away so she would have made it home by now she wasn't they started to get worried they called the police the police came around and they began gathering the details of the child which is when they got a call to say that there had actually been a child abduction around about eight o'clock which would have been the time that shauna was walking home alone basically some person had witnessed it they'd reported it but not knowing what which child it was no kids had been reported missing yet, the police didn't really have much to go on. What if it was a prank? What if it was a Halloween prank? And they just didn't have a clue, basically. But now that Shauna was reported missing, could it possibly be Shauna? At around 8.06pm, Dan Payden saw a little girl walking down the same street as Shauna. She was on her own and she was wearing a little gymnast outfit. He then noticed a man on the other side of the street. This man was very tall and thin. He was smoking a cigarette and he was walking in the opposite direction of Shauna. This girl was definitely Shauna. It was confirmed later on, so that's how I'm going to refer to her as. But obviously Dan didn't know at the time when he made his claim. So this man, as soon as he clocked Shauna, he crossed the street and he went up to her. He seemed to be speaking to her and then he grabbed her and he ran down a car round a corner and he disappeared. So Dan panicked. He ran straight after him, wondering what on earth had just go gone on. What did he actually witness? A child being kidnapped. He didn't know. So he ran and by the time he got there, all he saw was a red car, a small red car speeding off. So he assumed that there, he had just witnessed a kidnapping. He just witnessed a little girl being taken and then they sped off. So he panicked. He went knocking from door to door, begging people so that he could use their phone, so that he could call the police. He tried so hard. As soon as he saw it, he ran and he really wanted to help. But unfortunately, they were just too quick for him and they just disappeared. And I can't even imagine witnessing something like that. Dan, it must have been so horrible. He just witnessed a child be kidnapped. And then he tried really hard to help. It must have been so awful for him to witness this child's abduction. And I presume it would haunt him for the rest of his life because it certainly would me. Like I said, they pretty much confirmed that it was Shauna. So the police began searching for her. They set up roadblocks on any road in and out of Oil City. Basically, nobody could come in and out without being stopped. What if Shauna was in one of the cars? What if this red car tried to drive out of town? Anything like that. So obviously they put up these roadblocks. 
they told police stations within 100 miles, I believe, about Shauna going missing so that if anybody turned up anywhere around there, they would just know that it was her. And to be on the lookout, they searched the entire area. They went from door to door. They just looked everywhere that they could. Now the community and Shauna's family really, really did all come together to try and find her. Lucy was actually asked to stay inside because the police believed that Shauna had been kidnapped and that it was going to be a ransom note. They believed that they were going to call and going to ask for some money in return in the safe, for the safe return of Shauna. So Lucy was asked to stay behind so that she could answer this phone call if it ever came. So she wasn't actually able to go out and look for her daughter. But she does recall looking out the window and seeing hundreds of hundreds of people stood outside her house and they were all there to look for her daughter. And I do find that really, really nice. When a community comes together like that, it kind of makes you so proud and that the people were just all there trying to look for a daughter. Obviously, you wish it would have been under better circumstances though. So this was when the authorities went on to actually cancel Halloween. They thought it was too dangerous. It was the prime place to snatch up children. They were out. Some of the older kids may have been out trick-or-treating alone or with friends. It's dark, everyone has costumes on. It's quite easy to conceal yourself and Shauna was snatched from the street. So what was to say that didn't happen again on Halloween when it would have been probably easier? So they just stopped it and nobody really did push against it because everyone was worried. Nobody wanted the children out at night drug treating. What if this happened to their kids? So they didn't really argue with it. They just went along with it. Shauna's uncle, Keith Sybil, went on to lead a really, really big search group. It kind of split up into different sections, but he was sort of the main leader and the amount of land when you read it and you look into it, they actually covered is pretty astonishing. They were so determined to leave no stone unturned, basically. They just searched absolutely everywhere and it just kind of surprised me the, the distance they actually managed to cover in such a short time. On the 29th of October, two days after Shauna's disappearance, one of her uncle's little groups actually found something. The group were currently searching Colter's Hole and this is kind of like a hiking trail where people go camping and fishing and sort of teenagers go to get drunk and it's very hidden and secluded so it's kind of a quite a public area in that sense but it's very very well hidden. So there was this bridge that was running over the river that went through it and it was around eight miles away from town. So they'd been searching this area quite extensively when one of the members came across something by the water. When Keith went over, he recognised it instantly as Shauna's leotard, the green costume that she'd created. So they called the police straight away. The police came, they scoured the area, they did their own search, trying to find if there was anything else, maybe because they found this, they might find Shauna, they might find some other evidence. So, and obviously they needed to take the costume into evidence and send it off for testing. So the police just did their own search as well as what her uncle's group had already done. They didn't find anything else and this costume was sent off straight away. They don't know how long it had been sat there. It was kind of damp a little bit. So they just wanted to get it off and get it tested straight away. They did manage to find evidence from a sexual assault, which did lead to them creating a DNA profile of the person who actually took her, which is huge. If they found a match to this profile, they would know who her abductor was straight away. All they had to do was take the DNA off people. The day before Halloween on the 30th of October in 1992, they discovered Sean Howe's body. Three days after she had simply vanished without a trace. A man was camping in the area close to where they actually found Shauna's costume when he saw something near the water. He went over wondering what it was and he realised that it was the body of a little girl. It was Shauna's body and it was just 500 yards away from where they'd actually found the costume the day before. Everyone was utterly devastated and really shocked. 
the community and family members had searched that day, that area the day before, so had the police. So if her body had been there, they would have found it. There's no way they would have missed it. So that basically meant that she wasn't there that day and that she'd been obviously dumped there or whatever after they'd actually done their searches. On top of the bridge, they actually found a sweet wrapper and Shonda's shoes on the trellises. And one shoe was kind of facing one way and another shoe was facing the other way. They'd been placed there carefully. And it was at this point, I believe, that the police realized that they were being mocked. Whoever had committed this crime was actually mocking the police. Now, the circumstances surrounding Shauna's death, I really found utterly horrific. So she was found lay, lying face down. She was wearing a pair of shorts with socks that weren't her own. She had a shirt on, which was the wrong way around and inside out. She was pinned between a rock and a log and her feet were apparently partially submerged by the stream. So her body was sent for autopsy. They found that she had suffered a pretty horrific death when they found the full extent of her injuries. She had a shoe imprint on her cheek as if somebody stood on her face, forcing her face to the ground. She'd been sexually assaulted in multiple places. She had broken ribs, multiple contusions, lacerations, as well as hemorrhaging. They found that a cause of death was a fall, so she'd been either thrown or pushed off the bridge above. She'd then fallen 33 feet to the rocky riverbed below where she impacted the ground and she was still alive after that. It's estimated that she managed to cling on for around about 30 minutes after being forced off the bridge. And I can't even tell you how much it broke my heart to even think about something like that. This poor 11 year old girl, somebody had actually thrown her off the bridge and left her there and she was still alive. It just really, really tears you up to even think about that. How could anyone do something so barbaric to anyone, let alone a child? One strange aspect of this case was that they didn't really find any ligature marks around her wrists or her feet or anything like that, which kind of showed that she'd not really been tied up. So. She'd been missing for three days at this point. Maybe they had a room that they locked her in or something like that, but she didn't have these marks, so she was never actually tied up. The police began DNA testing all male members of the family. That's where they start with first. Generally, with kidnappings of children, it's, it's more often than not the family. The highest percentage of this is usually done by a family member because stranger abductions in comparison are nowhere near as common. So I told you they had his DNA profile. All they needed to do was find this person. Once they took the DNA, they would have the right person. So they matched it to all of her family and none of it came back as a match. So her family were ruled out. They went and checked literally everywhere. They checked the schools, they checked Girl Scouts. And by that, I mean, if they had any brothers, if they had any fathers, anybody that could have come into contact with Shauna, was just the DNA was taken. They needed to find out who this person was. I believe they actually tested over a hundred males in the community and not one came back as match. But in the same sense, they believed this person was local. They believed that knowing about Colter's Hole and where they could dump the body in a pretty secluded area and the, knowing the street that they'd kidnapped her off, that this person was definitely local. Now, like I said, they knew about this small red car. None of them had gone through a roadblock, so they assumed that the person that actually committed this crime was still in the town somewhere. The FBI did get involved in the case and they came up with a profile that they estimated it was a 20 year old Caucasian male. And that their behavior had likely changed after the murder. Maybe they suddenly quit their job, they got spooked, they just started acting strange after it. And they really put out to the public to just see if there was anybody that they knew kind of fit the description that they had with this red car and had began acting strange since her body was discovered. Tips and persons of interest came flooding in. And after hearing the description of the abductor, one person rang in and came up with the name Eldred Walker. 
Now, Eldred was known as Ted, which is how I will refer to him because that's how he was widely known. Ted worked in a pizza shop. Shauna and her friends had been in this pizza shop so many times. So they kind of slightly knew each other, like they'd seen each other around quite a lot. And this man was tall, skinny and smoked. He also had a small red car. It all seemed to fit. Also, people were a bit creeped out by Ted because he used to always ask for hugs off the girls, which they didn't really like, they used to run away from. So he was a bit of an odd character as well. But they took his DNA and the DNA didn't match. So obviously they kind of ruled him out from that. They were looking for this specific DNA profile and he didn't have it. There was one in particular that quite a few people actually came forward with his name and this man was called Michael. Michael, as soon as Shauna's body was found, literally got on a bus and skipped town and he never came back. The police and everyone thought this was really suspicious, but they didn't have that much to go on and they couldn't actually find him until years later. When they did finally find him years later, he had nothing to do with Shauna's case. Nobody actually knows why he ran because he literally had nothing to do with it and he was ruled out years later. There were quite a few suspects that did come through but none of them matched the DNA profile of the killer and so were ruled out. In 1995, Robert Graham was assigned to Shauna's case and he decided that he was gonna bring in a man called Robert Ressler so that he could have an insight into the case and gain his help from it. He worked in the beha behavioral science unit in the FBI and he looked into many cases, he'd interviewed many serial killers. So he agreed to look into this case and when he did, he put forward the suggestion that there was probably more than one person there. And this was a thought that hadn't even really crossed the police's mind before, but it made sense. She had no ligature marks on her hands and feet. She wasn't bound in any way. So if there was more than one perpetrator, then one could have been holding her down while the other one did whatever. So it would just be easier to subdue Shauna if there were two of them without actually tying her up. So they broadened their scope. They looked more into kind of pairs of people and they came across James and Timothy O'Brien. Now these brothers, the O'Brien brothers had a very, very colourful history with law enforcement. They had extensive criminal records involving sexual assaults on adults and children. They had done numerous other crimes within the town. They'd lived there all their life, I believe, in Oil City. And they just caused quite a lot of chaos in the town. James O'Brien had actually been identified by a 22-year-old woman who was leaving a nightclub one night. He approached her and he tried to shove her in his boot. Now she fought back and in doing that, he decided to slam her head against the pavement to, try, to kind of try and daze her so that she was easier to shove into his trunk. But what he didn't realize was that this actually knocked her out cold and she lay unconscious on the floor. Again, he tried to get her in his trunk, but with her being unconscious, he found it a lot more difficult to actually get her in. He realized that he was taking too much time and he didn't want to be seen, so he left her and drove away. And this happened in 1995, so once she woke up, she was able to give a very vivid description of her attacker and that it turned out to be James O'Brien. So obviously he tried to abduct this 22 year old woman. They had extensive history with the police. They started looking into these two. What if they were involved in Shana's abduction? Well, nothing really matched because the O'Brien brothers didn't have a small red car. They also did not match remotely what the description of the abductor was. Obviously he was tall and slim and these two brothers were the opposite. So that didn't match either. And then the police actually saw that they were in jail at the time of the crime. So because of this, their DNA wasn't ever taken. If they were in jail at the time of the crime, obviously they couldn't have committed it. The police had nothing and the case went cold over the years. And each time Halloween came round, it was a reminder of Shauna, whose killers were still at large and able to live out their lives, something they didn't afford poor Shauna, and it was most likely in the same town with other children surrounding them. So after they cancelled Halloween in 1992, 
they did eventually kind of reinstate it in the form of you were allowed to go out and trick or treat but not in the dark not at night time i believe they put a curfew on it between two and four the children could go out and trick or treat but after that it was not allowed because it was just too risky like i said the killer was still at large what if it happened again for nearly a decade shauna howe's murder remained unsolved They put out a $15,000 reward, which would be given to anybody with information leading to her killer's arrest. And the case was a very, very high profile one. It was so high profile, it was all over the media and it basically just got everywhere. But still, it went cold. It was in 2002 when they actually had a breakthrough in the case. So Detective Richard Graham, who'd been on the case for many, many years now, was looking into a different case when he came across Timothy O'Brien. He had to interview him. Now, as with they did with any male that came into an interview in the police station, this being a super high profile case, they brought up Shauna's name. He basically asked if he could take Timothy's DNA because they did that with everyone. He knew it wasn't related to the case that he was in for, but they just needed to do it anyway. Timothy apparently was very cooperative but when her name was mentioned in the same sense his demeanor changed he took the dna and he sent it off and it came back as not a match but he really had a proper gut feeling that he was onto something with timothy he went back through all the interviews and all the paperwork and everything that was related to timothy o'brien and james and at the time like i said the pair were supposedly in jail well they never actually checked this out. They had, in fact, been arrested at the time, around about the time of Shortner's murder, but they were out on bail. So they were walking around freely when Shauna was abducted and killed. Timothy's DNA didn't match the DNA on Shauna's costume, but what if James's did? So he immediately set it up so that he could take James's DNA and test it against the DNA found on Shauna. So he began delving back into the case again, anything to do with the brothers. On the 9th of January in 2002, a witness actually came forward, which was an old cellmate of Timothy's, and he stated that during the 9-11 lockdown, Timothy actually admitted into killing Shauna. So this kind of tied Timothy in with Shauna's case. Yes, okay, he wasn't the one that they found the DNA of the sexual assault on, but he could have been the one that killed her. Then in February, the DNA from James came back and it was a match. He was the one that had sexually assaulted Shauna. Now this linked both of the O'Brien brothers to Shauna. But what wasn't really understood was the description that Dan gave. He stated this tall skinny man was the one that actually took Shauna. And like I said, the O'Brien brothers didn't match that description whatsoever. So this brought in, maybe they was, there was a third person involved in the case. Well, after some more delving into the case, he came back around to Ted Walker. So how this all comes full circle and actually ties in is madness because the O'Brien brothers were actually living with Ted Walker and his son at the time. He was tall and thin, he was a smoker and he owned a, red, a small red car. But, like I said, his DNA didn't match. They'd already tested it, it didn't match. As with the, the O'Briens, nothing was really checked up with Ted either. When they discussed this small red car that he had, he stated that it wasn't working. And the police took it at face value. They never checked up on it. They never went round to see whether he was telling the truth. And if they would have, they probably would have found that the car was actually in fact running. So I really do think that because they didn't believe these people committed the crime, they didn't feel the need to check up on it. So they just let it slide. And the really sad thing is that all three of these men were involved. And it's just the circumstances of it all. They had the description of the tall skinny man with the red car, but the DNA didn't match. They had these two brothers who they thought were in jail. Again, they didn't take the DNA because he, they couldn't have committed it if they were in jail, but they weren't. So it was just really, really sad and strange how everything came about. They brought in Ted for questioning and he kind of told them that they were just going to do a Halloween prank. They were going to abduct a child. 
on Halloween and they were going to make it look like the police were really incompetent. They were going to make the police look like fools because they couldn't solve this abduction and then they were going to release the child. No harm would have been done to this child and they thought that they wouldn't ever get caught because, well, in their eyes, the police of Royal City were idiots. On the 14th of March in 2002, they went on to search Ted's house. They'd actually received a tip from the fire department that Ted was seen outside trying to burn a mattress. Now, if that isn't suspicious, looking like they're trying to get rid of evidence, then I don't know what is. So, the police searched his house, basically trying to see if they could find anything else. With it being such a high-profile case, Ted's face ended up all over the media with his house being searched in relation to it. And a member of the public rang in, Dan Payden, and he confirmed that the man on the TV was the man who had abducted Shauna. And this enabled them to fully link Ted to Shauna's case. They brought in Ted once more, and he changed his story. He said that the O'Brien brothers stole his red car. Being super angry, he got in his other car, he followed them to the corner where kind of Shauna was abducted, or close to it. He asked them why they'd stole his car, and they told him that they were going to bump up the plan, they didn't want to wait to Halloween anymore, they were going to take a child tonight. That's when he saw Shauna on the street alone and decided that he would take her. Again, he knew her. He'd seen her in the pizza shop. So possibly she's not going to just kind of run away from him. So he said that he approached her. He started talking to her about her Girl Scout cookies, which is when he asked for a hug. Like I said before, it was a normal thing for him to do, even though the girls found it really creepy. Shauna agreed to hug him, and when she hugged him, he snatched her and ran away with her. He covered her mouth to stop her from screaming and ran around the corner and shoved her in the O'Brien's car into the back seat. Timothy forced her into the back seat before they drove away, and Ted stated that he left in a separate car. The brothers eventually took her to back to Ted's house, where they took Shauna upstairs. Now, apparently, Ted was making dinner in the kitchen for his son, when he heard Shauna scream, get off me. He went upstairs and he told the brothers to leave Shauna alone. He said he didn't want to kidnap Shauna. It was the brother's idea and that he felt like if he didn't go through with it, they were threatening his son. And so he felt like he had to. He really didn't want to go through with it, according to himself. This was when, because his son had been threatened, he just left the house with his son. And a little while later, he returned, everyone was gone, including Shauna. He said that that was the last time he'd seen Shauna alive. Now, how true the story is, obviously we don't know. Police officers did say that he changed his story at least 15 times. So to me, it seems like he was, he was lying, but obviously take it how you will. On the 19th of March, they told James that his DNA matched the profile which they pulled off Shauna, the person that sexually assaulted her, and he just straight out denied it. He said there was no possible way that his DNA matched that of the person that committed the sexual assault. They spent years gathering evidence and everything they could just so that they had a really strong case against them. On the 3rd of July in 2004, Timothy and James were formally charged with the kidnap, rape and murder of Shauna Hal, with Ted being arrested the next day. Two days later, it literally took two, day, two days for Ted to accept a plea deal in which he would basically testify against the O'Brien brothers and he would only get kind of a third degree murder charge and kidnap him which would get him around about 40 years in prison. They decided to try Timothy, 39 at the time, and James O'Brien, 33, kind of together and Ted who was 46 separately. He testified against the brothers like he was supposed to. Now, quite a lot happened in the trial and things kind of flip-flops and things like that. If you really are interested in that, please do look it up because there's quite a bit of information that happened in it, but I didn't want to include it in this video. So, in June of 2005, following a two-week trial, the jury deliberated for 16 hours and came back with Timothy and James O'Brien being found guilty of second degree and third degree murder, kidnapping, involuntary deviant sexual intercourse and conspiracy to commit kidnapping. They were found not guilty of first degree murder and rape. 
like I said, if you want to look into the reasons why, please be my guest because it is quite interesting. They were sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. And Ted went on to try and withdraw his plea deal because these brothers kind of got a lesser sentence. He decided that maybe he would be found not guilty and would be freed. So he tried to withdraw his plea deal, hoping that he would be found not guilty. But he was sentenced to 20 to 40 years in prison. It took 10 years to uncover what happened to Shauna and bring her killers to justice. Yet, once the murderers were behind bars, the city still hadn't reinstated the nighttime trick-or-treating. Like I said, following Shauna's murder, they voted, the council voted to prohibit trick-or-treating after night. And that ban remained in place for 16 years before it was finally lifted in time for Halloween in 2008. So that year, a little girl, not much different from Shauna, that lived on the same street, but wasn't around at the time of Shauna going missing, did a presentation and things like that. And she actually managed to convince Oil City Council to let the children trick or treat again at night time. And in fact, they did actually reinstate Halloween back to normal. The children of our city were once more allowed to trick or treat after dark. And it just goes to show how hard hitting Shauna's murder was on that community, on the town and on the world, for the council to literally cancel Halloween for 16 years. I truly found this case horrifying, how these men could just take an 11 year old girl and throw her off a bridge, 33 feet down where she would lie for half an hour suffering until her body finally gave in to her injuries. They threw this poor girl away like a piece of trash. And I just can't really get my head around that. On the other hand, I'm really thankful that they did eventually find who was responsible and they were given the justice that they deserve. Not that that can ever bring Shauna's life back. Obviously her family lost the special little girl and the hole in the hearts of Shauna's family could never heal. But at least her murderer was behind bars and he couldn't hurt anyone else. They couldn't hurt anyone else. My heart also really breaks for Lucy. She'd forgotten to arrange a lift for her daughter that day, which is a mistake that any parent could do and probably many have done. Even so, she didn't live too far away within walking distance. You would never think that despite not having a ride home, that anything like this would ever happen to your daughter. It's just awful. I hope that her family were actually able to find some peace finally in capturing the murderers. And they were able to carry on knowing that she was such a treasure to the community and she affected so many people's lives and they can just remember her fondly. So guys, that was the case of Shauna Howe that canceled Halloween. Like I said in the beginning, please do stay safe tonight. Please be careful because cases like this really, really do bring it home. Just how dangerous the world we live in can be. And it's awful. If you guys do have any more cases that you'd like me to look into, let me know and I'll, I'll look into them for you. If you like my content, please like and subscribe and you can look at all my other videos of similar content. Anyway guys, that's all I have today on the case of Shauna Howe. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, bye.